Welcome to the Art of Medicine, the program that explores the arts, business, and clinical aspects of the practice of medicine. Today, my special guest is Dr. William Tarver. Dr. Tarver has perhaps the best job in all of medicine, and uh, he is kind enough to spend time and talk with us about it today. And I've chosen and the appropriate background, I think. Well, welcome, Bill. Well, good morning, and, and thanks for having me. Bill, you know, I think that you might have sort of the most specialized and maybe the best job, I'm jealous, the best job in medicine. And I I normally have the art of medicine behind me, but I got something special for you today. I think it's it's appropriate. So tell it, tell us what you do. Well, uh, I do very specialized medicine, which is a little uh, almost irritating to me, but I love it, so I'm, I'll get over it. Uh, so I work at NASA, and I'm a flight surgeon at NASA, so my job is basically to provide care for astronauts. So we often say something weird here at NASA, which I'm pretty sure isn't said anywhere else. We'll say, well, terrestrial medicine says blah, blah, blah. So... Oh, okay, so you out. have to, right, and we can talk about that, that, you know, we assume for all of our treatments and pathophysiology, uh, 1G, right? We assume gravity, you know, that's kind of a constant, right? Uh, you know, everywhere you go, well, almost everywhere you go, there, there's gravity, but you have people who uh, are weightless, right, or almost weightless. I'm not sure what the G value is when you're in the, the International Space Station, but it can't be much. They're floating around, so that's going to change physiology. So that's a whole, new, a whole new uh, world. But be, before we get there, first tell me what you know a flight surgeon is. You know my vision of a flight surgeon: some guy, you know, with one hand he's taking out an appendix, and with the other hand he's flying an F-15. You know what does that really? What does that mean, a flight surgeon? Well, yeah, the uh, the biggest uh, kind of joke is yeah, we operate on airplanes, but uh, that's not true. Uh, it's kind of an old term. This uh, flight surgeon came around in the early 1900s, for, maybe from a talk at a bar somewhere, but it has stuck ever since. And what happened early, early in our aviation world, we learned you need some docs who understand the world of the aviator. It, it's a different world. So just flying airplanes was is a different world. And then, um, uh, of course, going into space is uh, outside this world. But a flight surgeon. Um, takes care of people who aviate, so it takes care of crew members like pilots, and there are actually other people, um, such as uh, you know navigators and and other crew members. And then another application, if you go to the Aerospace Medical Association, you'll see a lot of uh, information related to the passenger care and the unique environment that you want to put. You know, your 80-something-year-old grandmother who's on a little bit of oxygen or something. You know, is it okay just to get on an airplane and fly? So that's part of our practice, too. Um, at NASA, I don't do that part. Um, we also have the unique work of uh, very few individuals that go into, actually go into space. And it is, gravity is nullified uh, while they're on the space station. Um, so orbiting the planet really is uh, the layman way of looking at it is falling at the planet, but just missing all the time. So. They orbit the planet, gravity's nullified, and that's why they do literally, they have zero G, zero gravity force applied to them the whole time they're on the space station. So, you know, my vision of an astronaut is a man or a woman who's uh, perfectly physically fit, pretty bright, you know, athletic. So I wouldn't imagine that they have the usual kind of run of the mill health problems that we'd see in daily practice. Is that still true? So yeah, that kind of gets into what uh, aerospace medicine is. Space medicine really is a preventive medicine specialty. So it is um, um, finding healthy individuals and keeping them healthy. You know, it's the opposite of what I learned in medical school. In medical school, I learned to wait till they got sick and came, and they, they'd come to see me. So what we do is we push out into their environment and uh, we're attempting to understand what's going on in their lives and keep them keep them healthy. So prevent those illnesses that happen to humans. 
So we do a pretty good job of that because some of the things that happen to us, as we know, is due to uh, the environmental exposures that, that we have. And the food we eat is an environmental exposure. Um, um, so uh, some of the, and, and whether you exercise or not, we'll call that an environmental exposure, but it's things you can more or less adjust in your life that affect your health and outcomes, right? First, there's genetics, and um, we don't affect the genetics so much at this point. We're not doing, that's one thing we don't do. We don't do genetic testing on individuals and, and make decisions at this point. Um, so our job is to uh, be, pre which means you have to select um, environments that keep them healthy. You, we select the healthy of the healthiest, um, and uh, we take them to space. Things still happen to ask humans and astronauts, believe it or not, are humans. So things still happen. Um, blood pressure things can happen. Cholesterol can be a problem, that, that sort of stuff. But one of the things I've learned, and I've been at NASA 15 plus years, one of the things I've learned is when we're talking about someone who's not doing what we uh, well, let's say they're not doing well in our flight surgeon, that's a flight surgeon mind, that means they're not pathologic like the rest of the doctors think. Uh, that means some numbers don't look quite right to us and we want to um, improve the numbers, but there's, there's not disease. <laughs> These are not people that are on a framing hand scale, you know, that are five or 10 or 20, or they're out there. We're talking about 1.2 and actually the framing hand scale is way too gross for us. We have our own index. Um, to measure uh, cardiovascular risk in astronauts. It's called AstroCharm. That was part of research that was done and it has led us to use a different risk score because while the average risk is, you know, way out there and expanded and the pathology is way over here on this one side, for us, we're very fine tuned to uh, the healthy world and we don't like that gauge or that fine tuning to slide off towards pathology. So we're pathologically healthy. You know, my vision of the astronaut, I think from the old movies is these guys are, you know, in Cape Canaveral in those days, they're jogging on the beach at 6 a.m. I mean, in those days, the many of them were military like yourself. They're used to getting up early and exercising. You're already in the 90 plus percentile. Right, they're they're eating right. I don't know. They used to drink too much. I don't know if they can get away with that anymore. Um, you know, in uh, today's, uh, I mean, they're super supervised, right? I mean, uh, well, the uh, I will say one thing that has shifted over the the years that I've been there. You know, we went from um, of course we've gone through these other older programs like Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, uh, but we shifted from shuttle when I first got here. Shuttle was going on to uh, the International Space Station. Um, and the, um, the commander of a shuttle is a little bit stereotypical, uh, and I'm being very stereotypical broad statement here. And that commander who commanded a shuttle crew was the old fighter pilot, test pilot, let's get her done kind of personality. They were very hard, like the, what you might imagine from the right stuff. That's sort of attitude for the most part. And the attitude also that was expressed to me by those individuals was, Doc, it's only two weeks. I can put up with anything for two weeks. Hmm. When we shifted to the International Space Station, uh, we shifted personalities. We went from the sprinter, uh, tough person mentality to the explorer, to the individual who's patient and will find a way and who will make it happen. So they're dogged but they're not rabid, hardcore <laughs> test pilot kind of edit. They're the explorers. So the ISS individual's mental state to succeed is different than the shuttle because two weeks versus average six months, uh, big difference. And it takes a different personality. So actually uh, a big part of the program at NASA is finding the people that are not only physically fit, not only intelligent above the average intelligent person, but they are mentally, they can actually get along with the other people. How many very brilliant doctors 
have you met and I've met, and they just don't get along, right? But they're brilliant. Well, that person wouldn't make it on the space station. It's, uh, it's right, someone... Does, the, the time duration changes everything. Like you said, two weeks you can do it, but six months, that's a whole other ball game. You know, when you're going on a trip, you're going to Europe for two weeks or Southeast Asia. It's okay. I forgot something. It's okay. I'll get it when I get back. But, uh, you know, you can't forget your meds if you go away for six months. Uh, yeah. That's a different that's story. True. And actually, the, the next challenge is, while that's six months, it's actually low Earth orbit. We can reach low Earth orbit with another rocket or another supply. And we do that all the time. We send supplies. Um, when we, we're mentally now trying to focus on Mars, um, we've got the moon in between. So the ultimate goal right now, the hard part is trying to go to Mars. And you've got to pack everything with you the first time. And then at some point, there's no turning around. So whatever we've committed to, uh, you're committed 100%. So that's a, a totally different challenge. Like how many band-aids do you put on that vehicle? And by the way, medicine is a whole different deal. I mean, pharmaceutical. So when you, get a, when you get a pill from the pharmacist, you know, for your blood pressure, let's say, on the label, it says, this is good for one year, because that's a good pharmaceutical practice. When they repackage what's come from the manufacturer, they will say it's good for one year. Uh, if our trip is three years long and we repackage everything to minimize the volume, you know, that, that medicine, it, our pharmacists will say, it's good for one year. So how do we even get medicine to go to Mars and come back and still be good? So that's a big challenge also. Give me an idea of, um, it sounds like there's some uh, psychiatric kind of health arm of what you do. How many people are there like you at NASA? Are you the only physician that takes care of the astronauts or... Is there a much larger team? How does that work? There's a team. So we're uh, broken up into, you know, different divisions. Um, and ours is a human health and performance division. Uh, uh, division? Uh, <laughs> directorate division. So we're human health and performance. And then in human health and performance, there's a research, a large uh, human research portion, because we got to get every, uh, every bit of juice out of this lemon, so to speak, that we can. And then there's uh, the clinical side, the, the researchers, we call it SD. I'm not sure why, but it's, those are our initials. So within uh, SD, we have physicians, we have civil servants and contractors, but overall there's a bunch. There's like 30 maybe physicians between contract and civil servants. And then there's another support group. We call our biomedical engineers who are, um, very important to our success is they're paying attention to um, maybe not exactly the human physiology detail, but you know what? You have to get the equipment from point A to point B to support all this. And then we have a bunch of rules and doctors may not be the best rule follower. So um, they remind us the rules and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's very much teamwork. And those are the two big groups. Um, and there are I'm going to estimate about 30 doctors in the mix. And we support right now, we're supporting more vehicles than we ever have. Right now we have, maybe, maybe you all know, but we launched actually out of Russia until recently. So we've been uh, launching on Russian rockets for almost 10 years. And then SpaceX came along and we launched out of Florida for the first time last year for the first time since what, the Apollo program. And a lot of listeners won't have been born during the Apollo program. Um, so they didn't know we launched from the United States before. So it's wonderful not having to travel all the way, literally 12 time zones away. What's that? The opposite side of the planet to launch and recover astronauts. So there's the Soyuz program and now we have a commercial program with SpaceX who has successfully launched from Florida and we have another um, company, Boeing, who's getting close and they're working on uh, launching and they'll also launch from, from Florida. And on top of that, so those are actually, that's three different vehicles we're talking about. On top of that, we also have uh, 
NASA's own program to develop a vehicle to go to Mars. It's called the Orion program. First, we'll be going to the moon. So you'll hear more talk about moon, but ultimately that vehicle is designed uh, to go to Mars. So we have that program where there's a doctor intimately involved trying to figure things out. And we have one more program called Human Landing System, HLS, which is that vehicle that will get us specifically on the moon. And we have a physician who's in charge of that. And uh, they have to have a lot of imagination because you'll ask questions like, how many band-aids do you need, doc? I don't know. Uh, I don't know, we're working on it, so. So let's suppose I'm a medical student and all this sounds pretty exciting and I wanna be a space doc. What do I do? How do I treat that? So uh, amongst our, you know, 30-ish, number of doctors, uh, what you do is you go do what you want as your primary medical training. You want to be a surgeon, be a surgeon. You want to be an ER doc, be an ER doc. Um, once you've done that, whatever you love, um, then there's the aerospace piece. Um, aerospace medicine uh, residency right now um, is at the University of Texas Medical Branch, UTMB in Galveston. Back in my day, actually, this, this one program didn't exist. I'm Air Force trained, so I did aerospace medicine in the Air Force. And you can still do that. Air Force, Navy, Army, they have their aerospace medicine training on the civilian side, it's UTMB. And then um, there are other, actually, now that I've said that, there are other programs that are coming up and, uh, um, and, and so there are a couple other programs, very small. So the whole thing is pretty darn small, but you'll do that aerospace medicine training in addition to whatever you've already trained in. And then it's also timing. Can we even hire someone? So um, we have limits on that, of course. So you'll wanna do your own residency, whatever it is. Then you'll go into aerospace medicine residency training, whether it's military or civilian, you can do it either way. And then you'll be looking at NASA. When we hire someone, generally, they've had that hankering to do space medicine their whole time. And they've been asking, actually, as a medical student, they go, what do I do? So when they'll look up UTMB and also look up NASA, there's clerkships, there are programs that we help, uh, help educate individuals so that they can come up into the program. And by the time they actually arrive at our door, we already know them. They've already shown us years of interest in space medicine, and it's not just a lately, Johnny come lately idea. And then once you get to NASA, um, there's only um, 150, 200 hours more training specific to all the details of space medicine. Well, I think that's very helpful, you know, and it's like a lot of things. If you show interest and enthusiasm and, and volunteer, and do all those things, and then uh, then it's you know well of course we're going to hire you you know <laughs> you're the well, and you're already yeah and I'd say this sort of job uh, appeals to the the physician who's an outdoor kind of person so if you already like wilderness medicine dive medicine you know those those things that are not just office based or um, those are the kind of individuals that generally have an interest also in this sort of medicine. Um, I have never been a person who liked to sit in the clinic and see patient, patient, patient. Um, a, phys a flight surgeon does a little bit of that, but that's like a small part of our job. The rest of our job literally is out there at the space station mock-up. Uh, we'll be in uh, Florida when we're prepping for a launch, and you're looking at all those other details that affect the life of the crew member. And we touch all those points not just in the clinic and not just doing labs and, and that sort of thing, but we're touching all that occupation stuff that affects their lives. We make sure the pressure in the capsule is habitable, let's say, you know, we want them to live. And then we ask questions like, well, if you increase the oxygen a little bit and decrease the pressure overall a little bit, is that okay? And that's what we look at like for exploration systems. Right now, the International Space Station is normal pressure, normal, breathing environment uh, compared to what's on the planet for you and me, for the most part. That's the plan. 
Yeah, I could see tweaking it like scuba diving. They discovered nitrox, you know, a little more oxygen, a little less nitrogen, and everybody's happier and uh, no ill effects that anyone knows, but a little more energy. Um, one last question. Way back, you mentioned the right stuff. In those days, I think the astronauts didn't really want to see the doctor because the only the only use the doctor was was to find something wrong with you and tell you you couldn't fly. Then you know. And uh, how about now? You know, do, do, what kind of how do you create you know a uh, therapeutic alliance right with the astronauts? Would you say it's still a little oppositional? Like, oh, I got to see the doc again. He's going to be, you know, he's going to find something and mess me up. Or, gee, I can't wait to see Dr. Tarver because he's going to help tune me up and I'm going to do even better tomorrow. Where, where do you think that, that sits? The, uh, the good news is it's less oppositional than it used to be. <laughs> the, uh, I have heard aviators and astronauts say the best that can happen is I walk out of the exam room with exactly what I had when I walked in my medical certificate to fly, right? Because that's, that's what's at risk anytime you interact with us. So that natural mm, opposition is always going to be there because someday we may go, dude, that's bad. You, you, that's not good. And while it's pretty normal on the planet, it's actually life-threatening if we're talking about a trip to Mars. So I've got to say no to that. If you ask me, I'm going to say no. But the relationship is much better than it used to be. But we work very hard on the relationship because we also we also do kind of medicine the old way. We take care of families. Um, when a crew member is in space, their main concern is their family. It's really and themselves. Well, they've already volunteered. They already know what they're going through, so they're worried about their spouse and their children. And they're getting notes from school while they're on the space station. Their lives go on. Um, so we develop a relationship over years um, with individuals. You kind of get assigned together and you work a couple of years before they even go on the space station. You know about the pets, the family, all that sort of stuff. And, and while uh, there's always going to be, we can always pull their medical certificate um, and we can't get rid of that. That's our professional piece. We have to do that. But they, uh, they I think, understand that. Our goal is to keep them flying, not pull it away. Bill, this has been fantastic. I want to thank you for joining me in the art of medicine. Uh, I still think you got the greatest job in the world and maybe a little bit outside of the world. And uh, thanks for sharing. It's an interesting job. Uh, anyone interested, look up those uh, information points and uh, keep trying. And it's been a pleasure speaking with you this morning. Thanks very much, Bill. This program is hosted, edited, and produced by Andrew Wilner, MD, FACP, FAAN. Guests receive no financial compensation for their appearance on the art of medicine. Andrew Wilner, MD, is Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, Memphis, Tennessee. Views, thoughts, and opinions expressed on this program belong solely to Dr. Wilner and his guests and not necessarily to their employers, organizations, or other group or individual. While this program intends to be informative, it is meant for entertainment purposes only. The art of medicine does not offer professional financial, legal, or medical advice. Dr. Wilner and his guests assume no responsibility or liability for any damages, financial or otherwise, that arise in connection with consuming this program's content. Thanks for watching. For more episodes of The Art of Medicine, please subscribe. www.andrewwilner.com